Hey, hello, everybody. My name is Timo Meckler, and with me today is Charles Adetoloi, and we're going to be talking to you about using Bayesian generative models with Apache Spark to solve entity resolution problems at scale. Uh, before we get started, though, a little bit about us and our, our company. So Charles and I both work for Mavencode, and we are an artificial intelligence solutions company located in Dallas, Texas. Uh, we primarily do training, product development, and consulting service in sort of three major areas. That includes provisioning scalable data processing pipelines, cloud infrastructure deployment, uh, development, deployment of ML and AI intelligence platforms, and then also working with IoT, uh, edge computations, and, and big data from sensors. Just a little bit about us and our background. Uh, Ch Charles is our lead ML platforms engineer at Maven Code. Uh, he's got well over uh, 15 years experience working with and building large scale distributed systems and applications. Uh, he's worked with uh, quite a number of companies ranging from startups to large Fortune 500 companies. I uh, uh, lead our client engagements in Maven Code and also work with our solutions team. Uh, prior to Maven Code, I had close to a decade experience working in an energy commodities world as a uh, analyst and strategist working with, with energy traders. All right, with that out of the way, uh, what we first like to do is really just define our goal and, and the problem that we're trying, trying to solve. And that goal is to really identify uh, profiles or records that belong to the same user entity, but may be occurring in, in multiple places or across multiple data sources. So for example, uh, I've, we've got listed here sort of three records that may be three records in different database systems. And, and as you can see, uh, they may be matching up, they may be, they may be duplicates, they may not be, but the idea is to uh, match those records, to, rec to link those records together and to be able to sort of deduplicate uh, and any duplicates that Maybe occur, maybe occurring. So let's move forward and talk a little bit about so why does data duplication occur in the first place? So one of the reasons is that you just have complete uh, profile information, complete incomplete profile information or attributes or even missing attributes leading to, to duplication. Sometimes you have got data coming from different sources uh, and then coming together in a new system. Take for example, uh, one company merging with another or acquiring another company and try and combine IT systems. Potentially you will then end up having the same data from multiple sources and you're trying to cl clear that up and remove duplicates. Uh, you might be dealing with data coming at different resolutions at different time periods and then accidentally ending up with multiple uh, rec recordings at different times. Uh, and finally, um, it, it sometimes even happens that you just have unavoidable errors. Uh, someone typing in a name or an address incorrectly, users making multiple accounts and systems, uh, all these things you know, that could happen and lead to data du duplication. So some of the challenges uh, that, you know, we face today when we're trying to deduplicate data from different sources are uh, number one, there's more and more and more uh, data out there today being generated by more and more people and devices. And just the sheer size of the data sets that we're dealing with, uh, increasing the complexity of, pro of the problem, trying to combine uh, legacy and more modernized IT systems and processes, for example, combining on-premise systems with more modern architecture in the cloud and trying to uh, do de de deduplication linkage there. And then frankly, just building a scalable system period of doing the de deduplication is challenging in and itself. How do you build a system that looks across millions of records in an efficient, scalable way uh, that's also affordable and completes the task in a reasonable time. And finally, how do we handle situations where we have inexact or, or what's known as fuzzy matches? For example, I've got uh, the name John Smith with an H and then John Smith without an H. Those could potentially point to the same, to the same record or they could be, could be separate. So how do we deal uh, with that? So those are some of the challenges that we face today. And we really see those problems across a variety of different industries, you know, hospitality, healthcare, um, insurance, uh, e even, even in, fraud, in fighting fraud, uh, social media, and perhaps something that's, that's more relevant uh, today uh, in community health and contact traceability, something that, uh, in, you know, with the recent uh, COVID-19 pandemic is getting, getting more and more attention. So really, this is a widespread issue that we see across uh, a variety of, of industries. 
All right, so let's start talking about solution. We identified the problem and talked about our goal. So how do we go about deduplicating data? Well, we think about it, one of the most basic or maybe naive things you can do is to say, okay, all right, I've got two data sources and I'm just going to compare every record out of source A or data source A with every record out of data source B. So that's pretty easy to set up, right? But the problem is that you can't, doesn't really scale, does it? If you're com comparing every single record with every single other record. So the challenge is unless this quickly becomes infeasible as your number of records grows, plus, you know, you have to do additional work to deal with fuzzy or inexact matches. So people have realized this and, and you know, and have looked to machine learning uh, and other methods to try to improve this process. And so, the, you know, looking at the different types of techniques, let's look, I want to talk about just a couple supervised learning techniques. And I'll just cover these at a sort of at a high level. Um, I'm sure these slides will be made available afterwards. You can look at it in more detail. Uh, but one of those that uh, folks might be familiar with, the logistic aggression deterministic uh, method, where really we choose our attributes or columns uh, first, and then we run our re regression against our, our labeled data. We end up getting our regression coefficients, which end up which turn out to be our feature wi feature weights, the weights on our features or attributes. And then finally, once we have those, we have our model. We run it against additional data, calculate a total weight, and if that weight's above a certain th Threshold, we consider a pair of uh, records or a candidate pair a match. If not, then it's a, a non match. So, this is fairly easy to implement as well. Uh, there, there are lots of uh, libraries and, and tools available that support logistic aggression. The challenge here, though, being you need uh, a, a training data, it's a supervised approach, and that training data. Uh, may not be available as data set scale scales. The other thing is you may have to fine tune this. You may have to fine tune the weights to get the performance that you're looking for. Okay, and going on to the next supervised learning approach. Uh, this one is a probabilistic approach that you may be familiar with called a naive based classifier. Again, we also start here with our uh, attributes and our, and our features, but then uh, instead of running a regression, the naive based classifier uh, calculates two types of, of probabilities, uh, a, a U probability, uh, that an attribute in a not actually non-matching candidate pair agrees, and then an M probability that an attribute in a matching pair agrees. Okay, so you've got these two probabilities, U and M for every attribute, and based on those, you end up calculating your weights as well, uh, match and non-match weights. And once you have that, those, those, those coefficients, those weights, you apply those to the data. And once again, once you have a total weight, uh, if it's above a certain threshold, it's a match like the pair is a match. If it's not, it's, it's a non-match. So uh, this requires a little less tuning perhaps than logistic regression and a little less intervention, uh, but you still need training data, right? You still need lots of training data, which may be harder to come by as you, as you scale up. And this also has limitations uh, as you scale up the larger data, larger, larger data sets uh, to, to, to run efficiently and quickly enough. So uh, those are supervised approaches. Let's now talk about one unsupervised approach. And uh, this uh, is also kind of fairly naive way uh, to solve this problem using something called uh, K-means clustering that you may be familiar with. So we take our, our entire data set, our entire our candidate pairs and split them into uh, two, two sets, two buckets, matches and non-matches. Uh, then uh, we choose a mean or a center for each, each bucket or have the algorithm do this for us. Uh, then after, after that, each uh, candidate data point is assigned to the closest center or mean. Uh, then the means and centers are recalculated and this process uh, uh, repeats. Uh, the data points are assigned to the closest mean or center and then uh, centers recalculate. And this continues until there's no more shuffling around of candidate pair data points, at which point we say the algorithm uh, has conversion and we stop. So uh, really the only advantage here is that this, yes, this does not require training data, but there are some pretty uh, big cons here. For one, and you might've already figured this out, it determines, uh, it is dependent pretty heavily on what the mean, the initial mean or center is that you choose. So the, so the uh, um, number of matches or the performance may vary from run to run. And so the convergence at the end may actually not be, may not be optimum. So uh, generally this is probably better for suited for the initial assignment of partitions rather than uh, matching up candidate pairs. But nonetheless, it's an unsupervised ap approach uh, for trying to link, link up data. Uh, now that we've talked about a couple of approaches, let's talk 
uh, real quickly about improving performance in running these algorithms. So cur uh, current solutions for deduplicating data, one way to improve performance is to introduce what's known as a, a blocking key to really help reduce your search space for a match. Uh, so for, let's look at this example here that I've, I've put. So I have decided here to, uh, I've got a table of, 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 of users. I've got the first name, last name, the, the uh, gender or sex, date of birth, and the address. And I've decided to split that uh, apart by the gender or sex into two separate tables. I've decided to use the gender as my blocking key. Um, uh, the assumption here is that that gender is probably something that we're going to have mostly right, that it's not going to be distor not distorted, meaning that in the, all the records that exist, that's generally a pretty high quality attribute that's going to be right most of the time. So then if I am given a new record of, of say, um, John Smith, that's given that that's gender male, I don't have to search the entire uh, uh, record space. I can only search those records that are then male. Okay, so that 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 increases my the efficiency quite dramatically. Uh, again, but there's a caveat here. You know, not everything makes a good blocking key. Generally, categorical uh, attributes are better. Uh, gender, uh, uh, perhaps birth month would be another one. Um, strings based attributes may not be as good. First names, last names. The key is for it to be a low distortion or uh, attribute one that you're pretty have a pretty high probability of being. Of being, of being accurate, okay? So that's one way to improve performance. And then uh, looking specifically at inexact or fuzzy matching, uh, the way people have dealt with this is to actually use various uh, string comparison methods to have a way to quantify how close two strings of, uh, are. For example, how close two first names are, how close two addresses are, how too close two last names are. So I'm just gonna walk through a couple of those string comparison methods. Uh, one that's very well known is the Levenstein or Levenstein distance, which is really just a number of single character edits required to change a string A into a string B. I've given a couple of examples there. John to John, pretty close, only requires one edit. John to Jack, a little bit more involved, requires three. Uh, related to the Levenstein distance is the Jero distance, which is another way to calculate edit distance between two strings A and B. This one, however, being normalized between zero and one, um, is a little bit more involved. And, um, and you can see that in this case, Jason and Jason, just one transposition on the characters is actually pretty close at 0.933. Uh, people, then we look, can look at common subsequences. So for example, Mike and Michael is, is, is a, a pretty decent uh, common subsequence. Tim and Timo, also uh, three letters there. They, they don't have to be consecutive. And then something like Frank and Bob isn't very similar at all. So this also gives us an idea how close two strings are. And finally, looking at just the phonetic pronunciation, Ashley with a Y versus Ashley with two E's, just Lee or Lee, the different spellings, just to see how similar strings are when they're sounded out. So this is a way to, to again, to, to figure out how close two uh, records might be when you're dealing with inexact or fuzzy matching, okay? Uh, having said that, I'd like to shift now into our approach. Uh, so we decided to, to perform distributed record linkage from Spark using a Bayesian generative model. And I wanna give credit here where credit is due. This, as, this approach is actually uh, based on some uh, research uh, that, that was done. So uh, I've got, there's a link at the bottom of the slide to the research paper and, and the work that was done. Uh, and also the resulting open source implementation of that research that we're able to leverage and then build upon. So. Uh, that's the approach we're able to take. Uh, some of the key features or advantages of this approach that I, that I just mentioned, the, one of the best things is that it's completely unsupervised. It does not require large amounts of labeled data so that that um, is, it won't limit us in any way. Uh, it supports both categorical and string data or string attributes, which allows us to use those comparison functions I just discussed. The uncertainty is reserved between different stages of this approach. And, and the nice, cool thing about using Spark is that it'll scale across multiple commute, compute nodes, allowing us as I said, for distributed computation and working with much larger data sets. So we're gonna be able to get the scale to work with, with, with much larger data sets. Now I'd like to just take uh, the next couple of slides and describe uh, the approach to this. And then I'm gonna uh, pass it on to my colleague, uh, Charles, uh, to talk a little bit more, more in detail and also show a demo. So very similar to other approaches I've described, we have to start with um, figuring out our attributes, uh, figuring out the columns or, or features that we wish to use. Uh, there's preference given the ones that are lower distortion. I have lower distortion, as that will simplify the, the calculation. 
uh, we then need to split our data set into a number of partitions, where the number of partitions should be proportional to the number of uh, Spark workers that we're going to be using. And there's a little bit of a trade-off of having balanced partitions, meaning partitions with the same number of entities and having entities that are close, uh, that might be potential matches. So that must be balanced out to minimize the communication overhead. And finally, there's a configuration file uh, that has to be created, which includes the Miles hybrid parameters, uh, definitions of our similarity, string similarity functions, their thresholds, sensitivities, uh, and um, length of our, our chain, and also the um, number of entities and records that we expect. Just a real high level uh, quick overview of, of, of all this works. Um, so for, uh, you know, for each partition, we pick a given entity that's linked to a record R. Uh, then for each of the attributes of that entity, um, we figure out a distortion indicator first, whether that attribute is just distorted. If, it's, if it is not distorted, uh, zero is returned, the attribute is copied into uh, the record R. If it is distorted, we draw a attribute out of a di distortion distribution. And then we also determine whether we've seen that attribute before. And so then this goes on for, for every single attribute uh, in, in that entity record uh, link. And then once that's done, uh, this gets repeated for all the other entity record links that are on across the different partitions. And, and as that's done, the, you know, things are getting, then uh, things are shuffled around entities and records are moved around the different partitions. Summary statistics are calculated including new distortion uh, probabilities. And then the process may repeat uh, a number of times this entire process uh, based on, on sort of the length of the, of the linkage change that you want. Uh, I'm sure that was a little confusing and, and very high level. I'm gonna pass it on to my colleague, Charles, who's gonna take it from here and uh, talk about this in more detail and also show a demo how it works. Yeah, so for us to be able to solve all these problems, we need to be able to model our entity. And to do that, we came up with a probabilistic model based on the um, reference implementation work done by Neil and his team. Um, a big shout out to him again. So they built a bunch of frameworks that allowed us to build this platform and extend what they've done, which is open source. And we're, we're gonna be sharing the link for this at the end of this talk. So the first thing we wanna be able to do is to represent the entity. So we need to do like a probabilistic modeling that represents the user profile. So uh, we have the entity profile, every user uh, will have a profile and that profile has a bunch of attributes. So those attributes are what defines the entity. The next thing after that is, um, we wanna be able to like partition things and group things that are similar together. Uh, that's the first way of logically thinking about grouping entities that are related into a common plane. But the advantage of this approach is like, because we're doing probabilistic sampling, um, we, may, we may start with like a bunch of entity in the same bucket, in the same partition bucket, but over time, after multiple subsampling and running through multiple iteration of this process, they end up in another partition, which will probably more, more or less represent the kind of entity and their relationship together a lot more closely. The next thing that we look at is the, um, the attribute distortion, like what's the variation of the attribute that this defines the entity and how is this like uh, different from what we think we all know it's the ground truth. And finally, um, we represent the entire, um, the entity that we, rep we represent the entire entity as a record that we can basically combined together and that entity record with the user profile and the attributes define the, defines the entity. So on a high level, um, whenever we are trying to solve um, the duping problem or record leaking problem, uh, the architecture looks more or less like this. You have a lot of all these data sources coming, data sources where you have all your data sets siloed. And sometimes entities in data source one and data source two may be duplicates or it, you may have multiple records spread across different different data sources that are like duplicated all across your enterprise so what we're trying to do is to the first thing we try to do is to basically combine all these data sets so we do a union so we create a, a global schema that represents all the common attributes and where the attributes overlap we try to normalize it and basically um, represent them with a common name so um, let's say in database one you have your attribute represented as for, for, for first name as first underscore name. And in database two, you have the name. So we'll try to like agree on the syntax that represents what's common to like all these attributes. 
So the next thing after that that we do is to do a union. So we combine the data sets. So that's a data prep stage that Simo talked about earlier, where we basically have everything that is similar that look alike in a common color. Then the next thing that we do after that is to um, try to devise a way of partitioning this data. And that's where the power of Spark comes into play. Uh, with Spark, you have distributed programming all laid. I mean, you have, with Spark, we have distributed programming in place where you can shovel things across different executor nodes in, in Spark. So our goal right here is to be able to like partition our data sets so that we can basically push each of these data sets in different executor nodes. And for us to do that, uh, we need to choose the right partition function that can allow us to evenly uh, divide the data and shuffle them across this node. So our partition function in this case may be um, an attribute, like Timo said earlier, that can allow us to evenly uh, distribute records across all these uh, executor nodes so that one node on the Spark cluster is not doing more work than the other node. And eventually this helps us as well because the way we're doing this thing is to be able to like do sampling, series of sampling and checking to see if a particular pair of record sets are matched are matching or similar to each other. And if they're not, then we push them to like another cluster. I mean, another node in I mean, that Spark cluster and all this process continues over and over like that. So for us to do that, uh, we, uh, we, we we basically extended the partition function trait that basically defines the attribute that we want to use to do the splits. And once we do that, we can create an, an almost evenly splitted data sets that we can now push across to all our nodes so um, a little bit of a refresher, uh, the Bayesian generative model um, basically is a way of um, doing probabilistic modeling. Uh, once we have our entity that basically we're trying to like determine if they're similar or not, um, we try to use the Bayesian approach. And what's the Bayesian approach? The Bayesian approach is a way of modeling I mean, I mean, modeling the behavior of an entity based on all the prior observations that we've had about the entity, like what's the behavior of this attribute, I mean, of this, the, the likelihood an object is gonna behave in a certain way based on what we've known previously about the objects and things like that. So um, mathematically, we can basically do it, uh, represent it with this equation where XO is the things that we know before, uh, P is our probability, the probability distribution, and X1 will be the posterior observation. That's what we think, what we're trying to predict in future about the entity. So um, let's use this case as an example. So Timo and I were colleagues, and um, sometimes people try to like uh, send us emails or just um, send send an information across for us. And this is. Um, a representation of a property, but the likelihood of like uh, getting my name right or someone mixing my name up for Timo's name. So you can see um, the representation where I've had it. So my name is Charles, but some of some people call me Charlie. So the probability of people calling me Charlie is a little bit high out there, but the probability of someone calling me Timo is very, very low. Likewise, the probability of calling Timo Charles is low, but the probability of calling Charlie Charles is very high. So over time, we have this probability distribution where we can observe and see the relationship and the likelihood between two attributes and use that to determine if that attribute still refers to the same thing or it's something that is not really similar. So in our case, we, cons we consider multiple attributes in parallel and we try to see, oh, over time, does the first name, does the last name, does the date of birth, does the address, and all those things have a, a strong enough similarity that we can use, like as in this person is likely the same person. So um, we can represent this mathematically um, as a big matrix that you see right there. Um, and this is what basically we try to fit into our RDD and we try to use to like, uh, model the behaviors and the relationship between our entities and observe and the observed attribute to see if something is similar or not. So, I mean, if it's Charles, it's a very strong correlation. Okay, I think the matrix is wrong out there. But if it's same, we can see the strong correlation along the diagonal and 
you can see like all the diagonal is correlation is a little bit low and things like that. So, um, so our partitioning. So basically once we partition that data, we start with like a big data set. So if we can represent all our entities as a blue dots that you see out here. Uh, we, we basically let, uh, use KD3 partition that allows us to uh, partition our data sets a lot of different dimensions so that everything that falls into a particular space or it's in, into a particular separation bucket can be grouped together and we can shuffle all those things to, uh, to a node in our, in, the, in our cluster. So uh, we start with the partitioning approach we want to take and depending on the way you're trying to, you're trying to solve a problem, you can decide to go with a different partition scheme. But over time, um, we found out that the KD tree tree is a lot more optimal for us for, for the kind of um, um, record linkage and the duplication problems we try to solve. So once we do that, uh, we push all the data sets to the node, and each data set is now like almost evenly distributed. We, we don't guarantee that the data sets will be evenly distributed, but if you choose the right partition key, um, things get distributed evenly enough for you to be able to uh, run your um, record linkage um, algorithm as back. So, so this is a high level overview um, from the Spark Nodes cluster. So let's say we have a five node, a four node cluster and we've basically pushed our partition data set to like all the attributes and entities um, all in one place and these entities initially they are grouped together based on common categories and that we use in our partition function. So to zoom out a little bit, let's look at node one in the cluster. So let's say you have hypothetically you have these three um, entities in that cluster. Um, um, if we can zoom up a little bit. So um, this is a profile of a particular person. So we can see like um, these profiles that represent two, three, uh, three different individuals with like a bunch of attributes. So our goal is to try to see if these attributes that represent each of these profiles are similar enough that we can easily collapse them or say, okay, this guy is still the same guy. So right here, what we do is to extract the entity. So uh, remember when, when I showed the probabilistic model earlier on, where we have the entities that represent each record that we have. So then um, we look at the attributes. Then we'll try to find the distance. So the similarity distance metric, uh, metrics that Simo talked about earlier. Uh, and depending on the attributes, there are different ways of measuring the distance. Um, if you're trying to measure the distance between name, is Bob the same name as Rob? Is um, um, Ashley with L E the same thing as Ashley with um, L E Y and things like that. And it could be geospatial as well, where you're trying to find out if John that lived in this address is still the same John that lived like 10 miles away and things like that. So um, you can try and do correlation by address and things like that. So we have all these sets of attributes and we try to like see how strongly correlated they are. So we'll run them through a process that basically checks and see how strong of a correlation we have. So uh, once we do that, uh, one thing that we'll find that will start happening after multiple sampling and running this process through um, our statistical uh, modeling process, um, mainly MCMC uh, processes, like all the attributes are similar, they get clustered together. And all the attributes that are not similar, they, they basically stay out of the cluster. So the advantage of this process that we're building on is like uh, we can broadcast or push that entity that is not really linked in node cluster one to like another node. So um, with that, um, maybe, maybe there's a record that is similar to this and clustering can occur, but if not, it keeps getting shuffled all around through our cluster. So um, we have a bunch of similarity measures that we use, and some of them are uh, Levenstein, Jerry Winkler, Jacquard, um, Metaphone, uh, Max Rating, and in some cases we've had to do the geospatial, where we're trying to see how far two different entities are from each other based on their physical distance in real life. We have a data set uh that has been pre-prepared um i don't want to go through the process of like uh, imagine and creating the master 
data sets that contains all the entities that we're trying to deduce. So this data set basically contains a bunch of records that are like pretty much duplicated. Um, I'm gonna try to load it up in a data frame so that you can um, see uh, what's in the data sets. So uh, it's basically um, a sample data set, um, I think. Um, it's, it's, it's a pretty much, I, I think it's a data set that contains the first name, last name, date of bat, um, address, uh, postcode, and, and I think state, uh, the data set is about it. It's, it, I think it's from Australia, so uh, uh, yeah. So what we're trying to do is to basically um, identify duplicate entities by looking at the attributes and try to like uh, filter out the, the duplicates and be able to show you uh, which entities we think are, are almost the same thing in real life, but they're represented slightly differently in the database because of uh, the attributes that are not really matching. So um, I'm basically load. I loaded up the data frame from um, this cal, um, this pack uh, CLI. Okay. So the next thing I'm doing right now is basically pick, I picked up the data sets, and I'm running it through the dedupe uh, code. There, basically tries to look out for the uh, for the duplicates. Um, we're basically loading up. The data that we prepared, and um, we're running it through the Spark job that basically looks through the data frame that represents the object. I mean, the attributes, the user attributes, and we're gonna like um, partition it and shove it across with all the different nodes in the cluster. Uh, before that, um, we look at like um, the attributes to see if there's any duplicate. So, like the first name. I mean, we look through the attribute just to know the number of unique counts that we have. And basically, um, I have an idea of of the count of the number of the objects that we're going to go through. Uh, the other thing that you notice um, is like um, we try to like make things comparable enough um, in the data frame the other time. So like uh, the data of bats, we try to represent it in a way that you can easily calculate the distance. So we remove the slash of the I fin. And that way I can easily do a similarity measure between someone's date of birth, someone that was born, let's say January 1, 2020, and let's say January 10, 2020. So that way I can do a quick similarity match. So we do that a lot. Uh, you notice that on the postcode as well. Um, and same thing with the, um, wherever possible, whenever we're dealing with integers, we try to like break it down to make it comparable. So it's gonna take a look while. Um, we don't really have a big data set out there, but um, uh, it takes like about 10 minutes to like run to completion. Uh, so, but since this is pre-recorded, it's gonna go a lot more faster than that. So I think we have something out. So I'm gonna go, uh, we're using Google Cloud GCP. So I have the data sets in my Google Cloud bucket. Uh, we collect, I mean, there are a lot of diagnostics that we use to like check out things are going on the clusters as, as well um, and the type of linkages. So this is the attributes um, that we have and um, the clustered attributes. So after running the algorithm for like 10 minutes, uh, we basically identify um, similar attributes for, for entities and we cluster them together. So uh, the next thing I'm doing out here is basically loading this up into a data frame. So I'm gonna just take one of the records. So let's take a that, okay. So you can see the output. Um, so things are similar, get grouped together on the same line. And if there's no similarity found, uh, you can see it's just one item. So these are like the record IDs and the record IDs are unique to each entity, but one, what, what the algorithm basically found out was like all these entities have uh, with more than one record, at, and, I mean, record ID group, group together, they all have um, a similar, they, they, are, they have similar attributes and they pick the algorithm, algorithm thinks it's basically the same thing. So um, the next thing I'm gonna do right now is to just try to load up, uh, I picked up a line item. Um, so I'm gonna 
just try to look up all these record IDs and we can look through them and see why we think it's similar and why we, we're recommending that the attribution be collapsed together into one. So uh, what I basically did was um, load up everything in a list. So you can see the list that those are the record IDs I would think they're similar. Then I'll go back to my original data sets. And um, this is the original data set, if you recall. This is a re record IDs, it's all unique. Um, all these other attributes um, represent the entity, uh, represent the user profile, which is the entity, but we think some of these attributes and entities or profiles are duplicates. So um, this is the data sets I showed you earlier. So we're gonna look through these data sets uh, for the record IDs I selected. Um, so let's do that real quick. So um, these are the similar IDs. So what we're trying to do now is to see if for these IDs, I'm trying to load it up. I'm going to take the record ID and basically look through this table to see um, what we're looking at right now. So um, as you can see, um, um, I basically did a data frame filtering on the record ID and look for I, I look for all the attributes that I picked up for that row. So you can see the last name. Um, the last name looks similar. So, I mean, as you can see, um, we picked up the record and for the record that we picked up, looking at a profile, uh, the first name, there's a little bit of typo in some cases. Um, the address is a little bit different. We have the address to missing. The postal code is, is similar and the, um, the states are almost the same thing. So the algorithm basically determined that this record and this profile um, all look alike. So I think that's uh, on the high level and that's the way um, the doping and record linkage worked and a lot of credit goes to Neil and uh, for open sourcing the base implementation of this uh, framework that we used and we built upon. So Timo, uh, you wanna wrap it up and take it up from there? Okay, thank you, Charles. Uh, just real quick, couple words as we wrap it up. Why did we decide to use a Spark framework? Why was the right choice for this particular uh, approach? Now, for one, you know, Spark is a battle tested distributed computing framework that's supported in you know, quite a variety of environment, uh, cloud on-premise, uh, et cetera. Um, you know, the one thing about the model itself, the variable updates using on, on a given partition of records entities only depend on the variables on the same partition, which is really quite important. And that allows for the distributed parallel computation across the multiple worker nodes and sharing of variables when needed as a Spark broadcast variable. Um, you know, by carefully selecting partitions, we're able to evenly, you know, distribute our partition data sets on the, uh, you know, Spark executor nodes, and then le leveraging really the full distributed power uh, of Spark. Uh, and, and finally, it's easily scalable framework, you know, that leverages the Spark RDD and data frame for the efficient data distribution. And then just to quickly summarize our, our talk, so we, you know, we we ran a a base generative model for data linkage and deduplication with Apache Spark. And you know, that has kind of led us to, to include the following to date. You know, by partitioning large partitioning data sets, leveraging multiple nodes of Spark, we're able to achieve scalability to larger data sets and decrease runtime, more so than we've been able to do before. Uh, you know, we have support for inexact and fuzzy matching via string comparison and distance function, which is really important really important uh, since the data we deal with often is, is not a perfect match. Uh, you know, and the great thing is we're able to achieve acceptable match accuracy, you know, despite this actually being an unsupervised approach, which is really quite cool that we don't need all this training data first. And, you know, the best, you know, as previously mentioned, you know, we have that cross-platform support by using Spark, you know, we can use, deploy this on uh, major cloud providers, AWS, Azure, Google Cloud, and even on-premise as needed. Uh, with that being said, we want to thank everybody uh, for listening in today. Um, I know we shared a lot of information. Uh, if you're interested in, in, in record linkage, data duplication, or just wrangling of lots of data, uh, please drop us uh, a mail or visit us at mavencode.com or you know, follow us on Twitter. And again, a huge, huge thank you, uh, you know, to the researchers and, and team that made this work open source, Neil Martin, Rebecca Sturz, and the rest of the open uh, source community behind, behind this project. Uh, and, and with that, uh, we'd like to open it up for questions.